Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to finish off this week with our final sludge track from a band called Yaucha. We're going to be looking at a live performance done on Audio Tree Live, which has always given really great stuff to work with in the past, uh, visually and auditorily. Let's dive into that. This, trick, this track in question is titled Of Descent. Let's see what Yauchas bring into the table. Very rigid straights. Oh, yeah. Okay. Real pretty, real heavy. Really interest interesting bringing those moments of uh, momentum. Mm. I love the playfulness uh, in their rhythmic ideas. Really nice being able to hear the guitar isolated right there. Very nice bringing all three uh, all three members into the vocal area. Drummer has a lot of tom work going on as well. Just really filling out this low end between the bass and the toms. Oh, and the bass kicks, yeah. Dotted syncopation right there.
interesting to see the bass leading the melody here while the guitar solos. interesting rhythmic choices going on all throughout this. I don't even so right here in the description because uh, I'm sure some people are going to hit me with this uh, this doesn't feel like a lot of the other music we've listened to this week. Emotionally, atmospherically, production-wise, yeah, I'd say that this definitely fits in sludge, but musically, it's exploring some other ideas. And uh, in the description, Audio Tree describes them as a band who incorporates elements of sludge as well as grindcore and doom to form a fresh sound. And yeah, that gives it a very different vibe than the rest of the stuff we've checked out. Because, uh, you know, a, a pretty... Yeah, this is I think this is something I've, I've picked out on every single song we've checked out this week. Is uh, the fact that underneath the production, underneath the grit and the, the grunginess and the, the compression of the production... Musically, these are songs that I could hear being played on the radio. In fact, I've heard inspirations from other heavier rock bands uh, in some of the music we've heard so far. This, though, does not feel like anything, even if you took out the aggressive aspects not something that I think would be very popular or palatable to a mainstream rock audience. And it makes perfect sense that it has the production, the sound of Sludge, but does not have rock musical elements, as uh, the description states, Grindcore and Doom. And the interesting thing is how often we flip between those. They're never simultaneous, and I don't think they could be simultaneous, Grindcore, I'm a little, a little uneducated on, but I think it's fast playing and Doom is slow playing. They're, they're pretty much opposite ends of the spectrum there. I think it'd be pretty difficult to combine the two simultaneously. But instead we see what they pull off here, which is a lot of alternation. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm curious to see where people might fit this into the larger idea of sludge because this feels like uh, like I said sludge production of other types of music rather than what I've come to kind of recognize as sludge metal from the other stuff this week however I think it's an interesting way to end the week because it shows the future of what sludge can be in much the same way that I kind of came to the conclusion that black metal is more of a production technique than a musical one and we have seen a lot of genres get black and variants i see sludge also as more of a production technique and something that should be combined with other musically focused uh, genres as well and uh, hearing this 
uh, sludging up Doom more so than sludging up Rock is an interesting way to see how sludge ha can evolve or has evolved. This was from 2016, so uh, you know half a decade old already. I don't know when the album came out, but this live performance is uh, five years old now, six years old, five and a half. Um, so yeah, not necessarily where it can go, but where it's been and also showing where it can be pushed, um, past what they're doing here. So let's dive into some of the more particulars of this and, uh, explore what's going on. First thing though, I, I got to talk about the, the weight, right? This is a heavy song. And I think a lot of that comes from a lot of the production that we've seen throughout the rest of the week as well. It is very compressed. We don't have a very wide use of the sound sphere. All of the vocals, whether they're duetting or uh, doing solos, are all centered. Um, our instruments are mostly center but a little bit to the left and right our drum is centered everything's just kind of right here in front of you it's not a very wide usage um or i should say a circular usage and it's not wide either the instruments don't feel far away from you everything is right here sort of right in front of you in your face it's very present um and we mix that with the uh, aggressive distortion in the guitars, in the vocals, in the even a little bit in the drums. There's um, there's a compression put on everything. There is a distortion applied. I think both vocally when we get some of the harsh, well, all the harsh vocals, and uh, in the production, there's maybe some extra compression, maybe a little bit of drive put on it. The guitars both have a ton of drive and compression and clipping and all the stuff that gives it that fuzzy grittiness. It's a very aggressive song overall, but then we pair this, uh, all of this with Doom. And Doom can be a very weighty style to begin with. It is slow moving. It drags its feet. It's very lethargic. There is already an, an implied weight to it because of how slow the song moves. It feels like even getting to the next bar is, you know, a task. It takes effort to progress the song forward, but we're pairing that with all of this heaviness in the uh, in the production side of it. And I think Sludge and Doom going together, uh, Sludge production with Doom's uh, writing style, composition, goes hand in hand. They're both aiming for very similar vibes, and I think that when they come together, they really support this single concept of weight while also supporting their own ideas where doom is about the lethargy of the weight and uh, sludge is more about the aggression of the weight and it really comes together to support all of this that the weightiness from either of these styles uh, brings forth the grind core is the in your face aspect of the sludge um, not necessarily the weightiness of it, but the intensity of it. And so we find that Doom and Grindcore actually work very well with the Sludge sonic identity because it's sort of like Sludge can be distilled down into these two ideas and they took the two styles that 100% represent those two ideals and they allow the texture of the production to bring out these two ideas from the other two styles, which brings out uh, all the aspects of Sludge. It really works quite well. Um, you know, from the Doom side, the lethargy and the weight of it all, we get very rigid, long, held out notes rigid playing and long held out notes uh, and when we're looking at the drummer particularly i even mentioned that uh when he's playing these slower bits you know we see him loosen up a little bit when he speeds up uh, especially at the end when he was doing the um the nice cymbal rolls and all of the fills across the the toms and the snare he, he loosens up a little bit, but there's still a, a rigidity to it. But when we're looking at him playing the opening line, 
right? And it's just just very rigid, very strict, uh, just really brings home the weight of it visually. But I think it really works well in emphasizing uh, getting these really loud hits, a lot of emphasis out of his strikes um, that brings forth some of that aggression that Doom doesn't necessarily typically bring with it. Um, and, and leaning into that aspect of the sludge production. But then we go to the guitar work and the bass work and we see more... Uh, again, like I said, holding out notes, really, you know, play a chord and let it ring and just let it ring and let it ring. Um, really emphasize again, this lethargy, this weight, it takes energy and time to take that next step. It really solidifies how heavy this music is. Um, and then of course, what is it like every th three bars? We then have one bar of, of grindcore <laughs> to just completely counter that. The drums pull out these wild, fast snare rolls, uh, and the guitar starts, you know, this little bit of shred, and the bassist is doing these really nice runs, and then we slow it back down, slow it back down, slow it back down, and then get crazy and move fast again, and then slow it back down. It's a really interesting way to create a song. I think if you had told me that this is what they do, and I tried to imagine it, I think I would find a song in my mind that I imagined to be quite at ends with itself, quite opposed to itself, uh, really difficult to find what it's trying to do, what the purpose of the track is. And I think that gives me a, strong, a huge appreciation for Yautja and creating a song that I think works well within it. It never really feels like it's two songs opposing or two sides of the song in opposition of each other. It really does feel like the grindcore aspects are a natural extension of the doomier parts. I don't know why. I don't know how. But I never really felt like those bars of grind were out of place. It always felt like a natural progression from what we were doing. Or I should say by the end of the song, it felt natural. I don't quite remember what my reaction was at the beginning because I was really taken aback by the drummer singing and, uh, you know, the rigidness of everybody performing. Just kind of uh, being struck by that weight of the intro. Plus some of the comedy there right at the beginning. <laughs> when the guitarist, you know, they're getting ready to start the song, he's just like, hmm. Like, you guys ready? But it was all that was needed was a little grunt. Uh, and then d demonstrating. I know this is the end of the set, so the people listening, or if you've watched the whole thing from the beginning, you won't really be caught off guard by it. But to me, the introduction to this band is the guitarist is hitting that chord and it just being monstrous. I don't even know if it was part of the song yet. It feels like it took place out before the song started, but, you know, I don't know. But just that one hit by itself. And I was like, wow. And then the band comes in. Um, you know, I was just taken aback at the beginning. I don't re honestly remember how I felt about the jumping back and forth between the two styles. But by the end of the song, it felt very natural. I came to expect it in a lot of places. And it gave way also to larger spurts of the grindcore. You know, we saw sections that moved quite a bit faster, especially there at the end, where it seemed like we were speeding up and speeding up and speeding up. But yeah, like I said, it, it works. And I have a massive fascination and appreciation uh, of their skill to combine these two styles so effortlessly. Like I said, if I had thought about it in my head, I don't know that I could have come up with something that flowed like this did. Um... Speaking about flow, all three vocalists jump in here from time to time, and we even hear dual harmonized harshes, I guess you can call them, from the drummer and guitarist and guitarist and bassist uh, at times. 
And I'm a huge fan of that, always. I don't know what it is. A band can have eight guitars, and I'll be like, yeah, that's cool. A band can have two singers, and I'm like, blows my mind. <laughs> I don't know what it is about vocals. Uh, I absolutely love when we have more than one, especially in rock and metal. Maybe just because it happens less often. Uh, you know, choirs don't blow my mind, but you put two people in a rock band, and I'm like, that's the best thing I've ever heard. I don't get it. <laughs> well, that's how my brain works. Um, so here we have three vocalists. I'm stunned. But the thing is, too, I think the biggest, uh, I don't want to call it an issue, but it's an issue for me listening to it, is that all three vocalists are very, very similar in, in timbre. They're all doing a sort of low, harsh, maybe a growl, maybe just a low fry. I don't, I don't know. But they're all kind of doing the same thing. When we hear the bassist, he's definitely lower in perceived pitch, uh, especially when we hear the bassist and guitarist, when they harmonize their harshes, there's definitely a, a pitch separation there. Or again, like I said, a perceived pitch separation. If they are doing uh, traditional harsh vocals, they're not actually singing a note. I'm not going to get to the science of that, but <laughs> perceived pitch. Um, but when we hear the guitarist and drummer especially at the beginning I couldn't really tell I heard the doubling up of the voices but they're also very close together so for me uh, you know I typically come to multiple vocalists for the spectacle of it harmonizing ideas uh, and here we don't get much of that and that's fine multiple vocalists don't always need to bring harmonization but the other thing I tend to look for then is uh, variation and we don't get that here either in fact this seems to be more utilitarian of uh, vocal shifting than anything else I noticed that when the drum section started to get more intense the guitarist took over and when the guitar line uh, took on a bit more of an intense uh, style the basses took over uh, nobody really took vocals when they had a difficult part to play uh, respectively you know I, I don't know how many of these sections were difficult for them to perform but the difficulty was uh the difficulty to perform it was higher than in the sections where they were doing vocals um it's like uh kind of like whoever whoever has the simplest part at this moment is the one who's going to do the vocals for this section that's kind of the vibe i'm getting um it's very functional over musical so I really appreciate it. I love seeing multiple vocalists, seeing everybody in the band jump in and cover that. I think works well. But the spectacle for me, why I typically enjoy seeing bands with multiple vocalists, neither of the two things I, I look for were present here. So it's cool. I like seeing it. It's just, it wasn't, uh, it didn't excite me like multiple vocalists typically do. But uh, like I said, it's still cool to see, and I'm glad they do it. Uh, it was also a little caught off guard to see the drummer start. I think that's a cool way to do that. Uh, kind of breaks preconceived notions. There are very few bands where the drummer sings, much less where at least a first-time listen, it's perceived that the drummer might be the lead singer, which is how I thought this was starting. <laughs> um, so yeah, just really cool on that part. Um, I think the there's two more things I want to talk about, which is I've already talked about the drum work. I want to talk about the bass work and the guitar work, and then we'll move into the lyrics. Um, the bass work I absolutely loved. You know, I just got done talking um, about oh, it was yesterday. Uh, what band was it? Uh, oh, uh, was that Leviathan? I think it was. Um, we were talking about black metal, though, and uh, black metal basses tend to get sort of sucked into the mix, uh, and they're, they're kind of difficult to hear, mostly because they play what a lot of, uh, a lot of the time what the drum, the, the, the bass drum or the guitars are doing. And so they're really fighting to be heard because they're getting in line behind another instrument more prominent in the mix. And here, the bass was doing its own thing. 
it did occasionally line up with what the base kicks were doing. I think those moments were actually really nice. Uh, specifically, the more complex, a little too muddy section where we had the bass kick and tom, just a lot of tom work going on in the drums. Uh, I think I called the section out specifically during the reaction, and the bassist was doing these really nice runs through there. Absolutely loved it. Bass was killing it. And that's actually one of the things I want to point out, too, is not just that the bass had prominence in the mix or that it was doing... Uh, some things on its own, but also that it had some really slick bass lines. Uh, you know, the few times that I actually got to see what the bassist was doing, he's all over the neck. He's moving from the top to the bottom, using three fingers uh, to, to jump between strings. I mean, he's putting in a lot of work to carry the low end of the song, and I mean, you can tell. I think the song works well, especially having these ideas playing counterpoint to what the guitar is doing. There's a massive gulf of range between the guitar and the bass. I don't know if the bass is, is down tuned or if the guitarist is just uh, just has a lot more treble to it where it sounds like it's higher but it sounds like there's just a massive gap between where the guitar is playing and where the bass is and uh, you know it really gives the bass room to play not even just at its lowest area but at its highest and still have its distinct range to stand out from what the guitar is doing um, and because of that it really stands as its its own instrument opposed to what the guitar is doing and when they're both going and they both have ideas flowing that counterpoint comes off real well um, rhythmically anyways melodically it works but there's also a lot of dissonance and tension introduced between the two of them which of course I think is intentional um, just really digging into the weight uh, and the aggression of sludge by introducing you know tension into uh, into the dyads that they're creating but yeah it's just it's really nice counterpoint hearing the two of them go off at the same time um, and like I said a lot of that comes from the composition and the bass work uh, it's just I love it it's great stuff um, the guitar, I don't see that there is too much I want to talk about. I mean, the tone was super fuzzy. It was very difficult to pick out chord properties. Uh, I, I usually just kind of heard the top note and maybe uh, the, the bottom note in some of the chords, but it all just kind of came into like wall of sound chord stuff where I saw that he played a chord. He strummed across, you know, uh, all six strings, but what I heard was more of one sound. I, I didn't really hear the the individual sounds coming together to create a chord. And uh, that's just gonna that's just something that happens with this heavy uh, production with all the compression on it and all that. I don't want to say it's bad, of course. It's a tool in the toolbox and I think it works for the specific vibe he's going for, but I had a real tough time uh, you know, laying down any chordal stuff, really being able to tell what key we're in or, you know, any sort of chord progression to it all. It all just kind of felt very samey because of that. Uh, and this goes into the guitar solo, which I thought was fascinating. It was noise, I think. I, it, I mean, it almost could have been improvised. Just play as fast as you can and move your hands all over the neck of the guitar and whatever sounds you make is the sounds that the song is going to be. Um, you know, it could be very possible that this guitar solo sounds identical on the studio and that it is, you know, intricately composed and rehearsed and performed. But at least to me, it just sounds like noise, which is an interesting way to go about it. It fits very well with the atmosphere that they're creating here with the vibes that they're uh, utilizing in the song it's heavy it's noisy it's weighty it's uh, chaotic which i think fits with the back and forth between the doom and the grind but it is also not a traditional guitar solo and i think that uh, a little bit of that is just me not being ready for it it, it was a little off-putting and i don't want to put that weight on the guitarist you know i'm bringing that bias to the table here you know, I, I'm saying I wasn't ready for that, and it was uh, it was a little odd for me, but like I said, it, it works well with what's going on, but it definitely stood out to me. You know, everybody else kind of uh, 
I don't remember if they got dropped in the mix or if the guitar got bumped in the mix. And I was like, okay, you know, his guitar solo a second time, he starts to shred. I'm like, okay, where's he going with this? And then I realized the shred wasn't really aiming for anything particular, at least not the appearance of anything particular. And I was like, man, he's just going for it, just making noise. And it's, uh, you know, it's one of those those dirty techniques not not that it's underhanded or, or looked down upon, but uh, a way to emphasize the dirt or the grit or the oppression or, or any of the, the more uh, kind of emotions that Sludge goes for. And to pull that out into a, a solo or a lead melodic line, um, you know, if he had played something more traditionally palatable, in the guitar solo section, it would not have had the same weight. It really wouldn't have. This was exactly what was needed. It's just, like I said, I, I wasn't expecting it, and it's not something that I typically listen to. So it was unexpected and uh, uh, unexpected for my ear, I suppose is a way to put that. But I had to bring it up because, you know, it stood out so strongly to me. I don't know that I have anything to say about it other than the fact I wasn't ready for it, but it's definitely what I think is a prominent aspect of the song because at least to my ear, it's very new. You know, we've listened to noise before, but I, I can't think of a time that we've had a song that was mostly consonant and then pull out pure noise, pure chaos for a, a guitar section, a, a solo section. So yeah, I think this is about the time we're going to dive into some lyrics here. Um, we got a few stanzas. I don't know who is whose, but I also don't think it matters. Like I said, I'm pretty sure that the vocal swapping is more of a functional aspect than making sure specific people have specific lines or anything like that. Uh, it says, I've been at war so long, the crosshairs rarely leave the mirror, but when it does, I'm not met with surprise, but anguish. Uh, such blunder and greed, your hate brings soil to seed. Such delusion, conscience, festering with fear of dissent. So there's, there's an I and a U. He says that he's used to having a target on his back. He, he's, been, he's been targeted for so long that it's just normal. And... If the target leaves, if, if he doesn't have the crosshair on him anymore, uh, it says, I'm not met with surprise, but ang I'm mad, you know, I'm mad that I'm not in your scopes, your sights anymore. You know, why aren't you focusing on me? You have such blunder and greed and your hate brings soil to seed. That is powerful. Your hate brings soil to seed. To me, that speaks to the ability of utilizing one's voice and thoughts of hatred, in this case, to make seed sprout. That people have, uh, maybe, uh, you know, maybe they have a little bit of hate in them, uh, but they haven't really had anybody to nurture that right? It's definitely something that they felt, but they haven't really explored on their own. And this person's hate brings soil to that. It causes more people to hate with them. And then he says, such delusion, conscience, festering with fear of dissent. Uh, so I think that's pretty straightforward. You, th this other, this other person thinks that they're better than they are. That's a delusion. Um, and they, they fear descent. They fear coming down. So maybe their delusion is that they think they're above everybody. You know? I mean, this this song right here, also, I mean, some of it is also just the punk roots of it. Kind of making me think it's uh, anti-establishment. We could be talking about ruling class or 1% or anything in that line. Um yeah, let's see where this goes then. He says, your mind wilts the impending guilt. Okay. I think that's pretty straightforward as well. Uh, your mind deteriorates because you you know you're guilty of what you've done. And maybe maybe the consciousness, the conscience is finally catching up to the person. 
Then we repeat the idea of the blunder and the greed and the soil and the seed. And then we get into this long last lengthy stanza. This is uh, what four of the other stanzas combined. Blind to filth and swine, eyes choose not to see. Lost in my own mind, forget the world's diseased. Create your own mirage, comfortable and trash, distorted, vacant, visage, surroundings reflected. And see, here I'm not sure if they're talking about the I or the them, the I or the you in this. I assume blind to filth and swine is um, a negative on the opposition, the ones who have blunder and greed. They're blind to the, the dirt and the pigs that are around them. They choose not to see. But then it says, lost in my own mind, forget the world's diseased. Uh, so are the first two lines about the narrator? That they're blind to filth and swine, that they choose not to see because they're lost in their own mind. They're forgetting that the world's diseased. Create your own mirage, comfortable and trash, distorted, vacant visage, surroundings reflected. So basically, he's just saying that you live in your own world. You're surrounded by garbage, but you don't care, you don't see it. You live in your own bumble, bubble, your own version of reality again could be talking about ruling class or one percent in this situation um call to save the herd stirring hates and nerves safe from consequence think you're heaven sent condemn the ones who sin can't stop the fate of men they're only flesh and bone your fate is yours alone they don't value life so protest with a knife I think that's exactly what this is. The ruling class put their boots down on uh, the lower class. Or even not even just rule, ruling, just any upper class, right? They live in their own bubble compared to what the majority of other people do in the lower class sections. And this is just the anger of living in this reality uh, come to light in words, which makes complete sense with the aggression and the weightiness of the song. You know, it's the oppression plus the hatred, plus the being tired of it kind of vibe. He says, you think you're safe from consequences? You think you're heaven sent? I mean, we can look at stuff like divine rule right there, and even though the concept of divine rule, uh, I don't know if it's present elsewhere in the world, but at least in the Western world, we don't really support that idea anymore. There are certainly people who seem to act like they've been given their status in life uh, by a deity. He says, you, you condemn those who sin. You can't stop the fates of men, though. They're only flesh and blood. They don't value life. So the ruling class or the, the upper class don't value life. So protest with a knife. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly what it is. It's a call to violence uh, to get your rights back, to fight for a life worth living uh, because those who are in control don't value your life. And like I said, I think that the, the anger and the, the tiredness and the aggression all fit in with these lyrics. You know, musically, I think this is a, a really good pairing of uh, spreading the word. And you know, everybody yells or screams in this song uh, as far as the vocals go. And originally, you know, I had mentioned it might be more of a... Uh, what did I say? Anyways, it, it was a, a way to make sure that, um, you know, the people who are playing more intense parts don't have to worry about also carrying the vocals as well and they can kind of pass that around to whoever has the easiest section at the moment uh functional that's the word i want it's more of a functional decision but you know pairing it with this i think this is definitely something that needs to be screamed this is something that at least they feel uh the message doesn't get across when spoken nicely 
Uh, this is something, I mean, even looking at the framing of it, I've been at war so long. We start with the concept of war and bring it back to class struggle. Um, so there's definitely a, a heightening of theme that I think works very well with the yelling and the screaming. So yeah, pairs very nicely. I got to check out uh, at least one other song from these guys and see what they do with the vocals there. Uh, like I said, I, I would rather, I would like to hear some cleans against the harshes, especially if we can have cleans and harshes simultaneously. But if that's not their jam, that's not their jam. Like I said, I'm bringing my own biases to the table on that one. Um, so those are my thoughts on Yaucha's Of Descent. This is where you guys come in. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know if you enjoyed this one, anything that stood out to you, anything that I touched on that you think needs expanded on, or anything that you think I was wrong about. Go ahead and let me know down in the comment section. Above that, you can find the description box, and in there is a link for Linktree. It'll take you to this menu right here. It has everything related to the channel. You can pick up some merch, join Patreon to vote on future themes and songs. You can follow me on Twitter, uh, check out the music I've been making and what I've been listening to. I don't know, man. There's a lot of stuff in there. Go ahead and check it out. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, that wraps it up for this one. We do have a special selection next from an Italian band. Uh, I'm not sure the genre, but I'm interested in looking at that. Uh, tomorrow we'll have a album review at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC. On Sunday, we'll have our first time ever fourth Patreon live stream in a single month. We have had a ton of people join on to the Patreon and uh, so we've been getting a lot of participation in the live streams. So yeah, that, that's the first. I don't know what's going to happen if we go past that, though. Not every month has five weeks. Uh, but yep, so if you're part of the Patreon, make sure you join that, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Otherwise, it should be available the Monday after, assuming I can get that done in a timely manner. Otherwise, it'll be the Tuesday. Uh, that'll be available to watch recorded on your own uh, publicly for everyone to view and then of course monday we'll be back 5 p.m eastern standard time 9 p.m utc with next week's theme and a special selection until next time remember to be critical but not cynical of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning afternoon or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos